Hallelujah. It's good to be back in church. Hope we've all been well. Yes. Did you enjoy July? Did you enjoy the 3 a.m. prayers? Was it good? I hope you're still doing it. I'm still trying to, to try to get into the place of prayer for at least 3.33 so that I can call upon the name of the Lord. I'm being wise. And, you know, I've spoken to Pastor now. We've got so many confirmations. It's been really wild to see. I'm like, I, you know, this Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 scripture um, call upon, um, you know, blah, blah. <laughs> call out to me and I will show you great and wondrous things which you know not of you know, um, is such a key for this year. And Pastor Nat had shared, you know, a couple of weeks or even months ago about how 33 was, um, you know, his number for the year that the Lord had spoken to him. But in the last couple of weeks, I'm sure when he's back, he'll share a bit more about how God has literally been freaking him out with the number 33, you know, and we've seen it with other people confirmed. I think somebody even at church had also sent Pastor Nat, you know, a confirmation on these, these prayers and fasting that he's going into for his birthday, I'm calling on the Lord for 33 days, you know, um, and, and yeah, so I'm trying to, you know, as much as I can still try and observe even that 333, you know, just call upon the Lord for what we don't know, that he will break open our understanding. He will show us stuff that we don't understand and he will help us to also key into what his agenda is. There's something clearly about the number. There's something clearly about that scripture, you know, this year and the Lord is working it, like I said, not just on a personal level, um, but even on a global level. So I pray that God will find us faithful in the place of prayer to be able to partner with him for what he wants to do um, on small and big stages in Jesus name. Amen. We're going to um, speak on triumph, on triumph. This was another um, word that the Lord had spoken to my heart and um, quite remarkably um, he has, you know, confirmed it. Let's start um, with um, the definition for, for triumph. So if you were just to, to look it up, you know, on Google, let me just get my photos back up. On the definition of, tri of triumph, it would say that triumph is a great victory or achievement. Um, it would say that triumph is a processional entry um, of a victorious general into ancient Rome, and we'll look a little bit at that, that history in, 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 in a second. It says, to achieve a victory, to be successful, to win, to succeed, um, to gloat, to swagger, to brag. Um, it says that triumph is conquest, it is jubilation, it is exaltation, it is elation. It says that um, triumph... Um, is as maybe, you know, a victory by military force when you have a, achieved a very great um, success. It says that triumph is um, a feeling of great satisfaction and pride re resulting from a success or a victory. So in, in preparation, what I learned is that triumph is different from victory in that very often when you want to define victory, you won't use the word triumph, but when you want to define triumph, very often the word victory comes up. Another, another definition that I read, it says that, you know, that triumph is essentially victory after a very hard fought battle. When the battle has been very hard fought, it's been long and it's drawn out and suddenly you have been able to finally conquer. You've been able to stand and you're left as the victor, as the winner after a very hard, long fought battle, a war that is when you can call that sort of win a triumph. So it's not just an ordinary victory. It's not just a win in battle. It's literally, um, it's, it's when you have been contending against a very stubborn thing, against a very stubborn enemy for a very long time, and you get to the end and you're the one left standing. You're the victorious one. You can say that you have had a triumph. There are a couple of words in the Bible um, which speak about triumph, um, and they all have slightly different but um, 
similar sort of themes, I will um, go to the word rena in the scripture, um, where it defines triumph as a shrill sound, a cry. Um, it can be a proclamation, a rejoicing. Um, it's defined as cry, but, you know, like a, not just cry, <laughs> I'm crying, but a loud cry. Um, so triumph in that sense can be an act. You know, you, you can triumph by crying aloud. It's one of the, how should I say, components of triumph. And very often, in, especially in the olden days, or I'm sure even in war today, when there is a loud shout or a loud, you know, you talk about a cry or a shout in our camps or in the camps of the enemy, it can denote a triumph, a ringing cry. Other versions will say uh, an entreaty, a supplication. So, for example, 1 Kings 8 and verse 28, it says, Have respect for the prayer of your servant and his supplication, and hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you day and night. That cry that is talking about there is interchangeable for triumph, but it means supplication. It means plea or entreaty. Then there is the word rua, R-U-A, in the scripture. And um, it's another word that, um, that is linked to the word triumph. And it essentially means to split the ears with a sound. To split the ears with a sound. To make a breaking sound. To shout for alarm or to shout for joy. To blow an alarm. To destroy. To make a joyful noise. To triumph. In that way, it says that it is to give a blast, a war cry, an alarm of battle, to sound a signal for war or for march. It says to shout in applause, to shout with religious impulse. So when we say, make a joyful noise to the Lord, and everybody says, hallelujah. It's not just supposed to be an act, but it's supposed to be something that has a very real power. Right? It also says it can mean to cry out in distress, to utter a shout. So again, this is another act of triumph. Uh, and I'm making this distinction because what I want to focus in on today is not so much the act of triumph as a, a different kind of triumph. So for example, we see this Rua um, and Rino type of triumph when we look at, for example, the children of Israel when they are surrounding the wall of Jericho. And they had marched and marched and marched and marched around it. And the instruction was to do that once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day to do it seven times. And then on the seventh day after they have done it to give a shout, right? So they gave a shout of victory. And for those who are familiar with the story, the walls of Jericho came tumbling flat. Like I say, when, when we say within the body of Christ to give a joyful noise unto the Lord or to shout unto the Lord, it's not just because the Lord likes to hear, hallelujah! You know, it's actually because it's supposed to carry a real weight spiritually. Are we together? Yeah, like, you're not just, like, making God happy. It's not just like, ah, thank you. I'm calm now. You have shouted hallelujah. It's not for his calmness. It's not, you know, just, to, you know, for, for sake of his health. It's actually because in times past and should even be now that when we make a noise unto the Lord, when he is pleased with that praise, right? That there is something, just like with our prayer, the Bible tells us, you know, that our prayers are not just mere words, right? But they are made powerful by God. You know, the, the scripture speaks about that, about prayer, that you're not just speaking your English or your Yoruba, your Igbo, or your tree or whatever language it is that you speak, but that when you speak forth, the Lord God Almighty makes it such that your petitions and your prayers have a real potent force, a real spiritual force. And they go forth, especially with the word of God, to be able to exact things in the earth. In the same way with our shout, when we give a shout unto the Lord. When it is done with revelation, when it is done with understanding. You know, there's so many different tools and keys that the Lord will give us over the course of our lives. Sometimes we'll face things and the Lord will say, you know what? You know what? 
don't stress, just dance. Sometimes he will say, just sing unto the Lord. Sometimes he'll say, oh, no, for this, you know what, set out a time of fasting. Sometimes he'll say, oh, no, to be able to break the spirit of poverty and of lack, you know, why don't you give generously? Be a person who scatters abroad freely. Why don't you be diligent in the payment of your tithes and in your offerings? There are certain spiritual, how should I say, codes or keys or expo intelligence for different matters. And one of them is the shout of triumph. When done with understanding and with revelation, it has a real power. But like I said today, I don't really want to focus in on, on the act of triumph. Because you see, the act of triumph really only makes sense within a, a particular context. The act of triumph really must be located within some sort of contention, within some sort of battle, within some sort of warfare. Are we still together? right? It's only a triumph, like I say, when there has been a hard, long, or hard-fought battle. And so the act of triumph comes at a very particular time. And so today I want to speak about the journey of triumph, the journey of triumph, or the journey to triumph, whichever. If we look... Um, In the scripture, if we go to 2 Corinthians 1, where am I now? Sorry, I've got notes across different places. 2 Corinthians 1, and I believe it's verse 4. Or 14. Hang on, sorry. Pardon me, guys. I don't know why I don't have this here. <clears throat> Sorry, Second Corinthians 2. Second Corinthians 2. And verse 14. I'm just going to scroll down. It says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory. And through us spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. For we are the sweet fragrance of Christ, which, ex which Christ exhales unto God discernible alike among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the latter, it is an aromance wafted from death to death. To the former, it is an aroma from life to life. And who is qualified? For we are not like so many peddling and making a trade of God's word. But like men of sincerity and the purest motive, commissioned and sent by God, we speak his message in Christ, in the very sight and the presence of God. The key scripture is verse 14, that we are led as trophies in triumph of Christ's victory. There are many journeys to triumph in the life of a believer all of which are part of our ultimate journey to triumph, right? So the whole walk of our faith, if the whole point of um, living on the earth was so you would give your life to Christ, we've, I mean, I'm sure you've heard before, once you gave your life to Christ, God would just be like, okay, today's your day, come back home. But the point isn't just to give your life to Christ, it isn't just to be saved, Right? In the same way, the whole point of Adam and Eve being in the garden was not just to enjoy a garden. So in the beginning, when God fashioned humanity, he made um, those who were in his image. And the whole point of it was that these ones would choose him willingly. Unlike the angels, the angels, other created beings that, that God has made, they don't have a choice. They are programmed to worship God. 
which is why the, rebe the rebellion of Satan, of Lucifer, is such a big deal. Because it is not by choice. You are programmed. You are under mandate to worship the Lord. And God created man and created man in his image that these ones would radiate his glory. We are made like him. The Bible says that ye are gods. It's actually when you don't know that ye are gods that the Bible says you will die like mere men. When you understand that you are made in the image of God and that God has placed you here for a purpose, the point was for Adam and Eve to walk in fellowship with God. The scripture records that in the cool of the day, God will come down and he would fellowship with them. The whole point was that as they fellowship together, something would happen within man. They would come into understanding of the mandate that he gave them of subduing the earth, of replenishing it, of putting other things, bird, fish, all of this stuff under the control. And they would be sort of like the next cadre of authority under God. Elsewhere, the scriptures say that, that who is man that you are so mindful of him that you have made him a little lower than in the original the scripture actually says that you have made him a little lower than God. But the people who compiled the text back then, they couldn't wrap their minds around it. Some of them have written in that you have made him a little lower than the angels. But not so. In its original form, what it says is that you have made him a little lower than God. That we would be the next realm or the next cadre of authority. And then the earth that was, you know, fallen we, as children of God, will bring it into redemption. That mandate is echoed in Romans 8. God says that the whole earth groans and it waits for the manifestation of who? Of the sons and the daughters of God. It doesn't say of Christians and of people who profess belief in God. You know, those two are different. The scriptures speak very clearly about who is an heir, who is a son of God. And who is like a servant within the house who doesn't really understand their rights. The scripture also speaks about the son who when he's a baby and acting like a baby is actually no more valuable to the house than the servant. Are we still together? Yes, because he doesn't really know. He does like the prodigal son. He just doesn't understand. He's just squandering you know, his father's property, resources, not caring about the will and the, and the legacy that his father is trying to establish. But also the son that is left at home, the big brother that doesn't also understand that he's at home and all that his father has is his. They are carrying the title of son, of heirs, but they are not carrying the revelation of sons. Are we still together? Romans 8 says that the whole earth, if we read it, is subject on the part of its maker, very deliberately subject to sickness, to failing, to ailing, to fragility, waiting for those who will arise in their understanding that they are sons and daughters of God. And it is them that will bring the earth into the place that it ought to be. Are we still together? so that I don't veer too much off. That was the mandate from the very beginning. We come into Christ, that mandate doesn't change. In fact, if anything, it just becomes clearer to us. So there are many journeys to triumph that we will make our ultimate triumph is to be able to bring the earth into where it is, is to be able to be conformed to the image of Christ, to stand and to be like him in full maturity. Revelation says until we get to a place where the bride and the spirit, the spirit who is left with us, the Holy Spirit who is transforming us into Christ, together the spirit, I think it's Revelation 22 or, verse, or, 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 or chapter 19, one of the two, that together the spirit and the bride will cry and they will say, bridegroom, come. And then the Lord will come. So we are on that journey to triumph. We are on, on that journey to when sickness will really have nothing on us. 
when death will be under our feet, when all of the things which ail humanity now, which are part of the earthen experience, come truly under our feet. At the moment, we exercise our dominion over those things and we continue to proclaim the things that are as, that aren't as though they were. This is the journey of faith. It is the journey towards triumph. It is the ultimate journey. But in the course of our lives, we are fighting many different battles, some of them which are hard-fought and long-drawn battles that are also battles towards triumph. And what better confirmation really for this word on triumph than for the Lord to have given it. I didn't realize at the time until I was preparing the message on the cusp of the Olympics. On the cusp of the Olympics. You see, when, when Paul speaks to the Corinthians in this scripture that we have read, he's painting a very specific picture to them. Of an, Olympic, of an Olympics that they have seen. Remember that the, 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 um, the New Testament believers are living in a time when Rome is governing the earth. You know, there are many dispensations that have governed the earth, right? But at the time, Jesus Christ died a death of crucifixion. I hope we know that he was not the only one to be crucified on the cross, right? On the day that he died, there were other people who were crucified there, right? It was a form of Roman punishment. It was specific to the rulers of the time. They were Romans. It was Roman crucifixion. And so when Paul is speaking to the Corinthians in this scripture, he's painting for them an Olympic image. Because Rome begins the the Olympics, so to speak. How it happened was that when the, when the um, generals and whatnot had gone out to war, what would happen, what their triumphal procession looked like was that when they came back with the spoils of war, the general who had taken them to war and brought them back, he would come and there would be four chariots you know, four horse-drawn car um, chariots and carriages that would bring him in. What would happen is that there would be musicians and all of this stuff that would go before him. And then he would come on the chariots and behind him, all of his infantry, all of the men, surviving men of warfare would march on foot behind him. And all of the people of the town, all of the people, they would gather in the city square. They would gather at the square, the center of the town. Because back then, the Romans had a god called Dionysus, right? And there was an image of Dionysus that was set up. And so this general, a wreath, a laurel wreath, if media can help us and just um, Google a, a laurel wreath, um, you'll see it. You see it even today. Many companies use a laurel wreath for their logo, right? Because it symbolizes victory. It symbolizes triumph. That, that symbol has continued down through the ages as a symbol of victory. When you find it, you could just put it up on the screen. And a, a, a wreath, a laurel wreath of victory would be made for the general. He would wear that like a crown. And he would go through and all of the people would be there, all of the people of the town, whether you were young or you were old or whatever. And everybody would watch you come in. It was a very, very, very high honor. And he would make his way to the image of Dionysus. And when he goes there he would put his laurel crown into the lap of their God as a tribute. You know, the way we say, like, we casting crowns, lift, you know, on that, that we will cast our crowns before the Lord. And he would go and he would do that into the lap of his God, thanking Dionysus for having brought them through, you know, the valley of the shadow of death, so to speak. And so just the same way, if I want to speak to you today and I want to really capture your attention, I will speak about something that is quite quintessentially Nigerian, right? I will paint a picture of our day. I can't think of an example right now, but maybe small chops. It always comes to my mind. I can't help it. You know, I would speak to you in a language that you understand. In the same way, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians in a language that they understand. When he's talking about triumph, 
He understands that it triggers in their mind this thing, this, this act, this procession that they have seen before. When he's saying that God leads us, yes, we all know, we've all seen that image before. So it would be made like this, like a laurel wreath. And from there comes that other thing that you see a lot of times in logos for businesses and things like that. And it, it was a mark of, of victory, right? And he would wear it and then he would cast it before his God. It was his crown. He would cast it. So he was provoking a very particular image in the mind of of, of believers at the time that this is the way. The same way that you have seen the generals of war come in and everyone is looking and marveling at their victory. This is the same way that in Christ you are led victorious. This is the same way in which there is a triumphant procession for you when you are in Christ. But as we know, That may speak of warfare battle. Or when they went to their Olympics and they won their wreaths, it may speak of their Olympic victories. And like I say, what an amazing um, confirmation that this word came on the cusp of the 2024 Olympics. You see, the, the, the thing with the journey to triumph is that it's more than an act of triumph. When the Lord gave the word on triumph, it's exciting. We are going to triumph. But sometimes what we forget is the context, that what it means is that we may have to do some act of battle. That there might be some long, drawn-out contention before that act of triumph. Are we still together? That there is actually a journey to triumph. Like I say, in the life of a believer there will be many journeys towards different triumphs. For example, you're battling an addiction. You're trying to be free of masturbation, of pornography, of an addiction to food, of an addiction to money, of an addiction to whatever it may be, to lying, to stealing. And you're trying and you're trying and you're trying and you're trying. And you've made your, yourself accountable and you've put the measures in place and whatnot and you still feel like, for whatever reason, I still seem to be slipping and falling every now and then. And you've been battling this thing for years, very many years. For you, that is a hard fought or a drawn out battle. But I want to encourage you that you will get to the point of triumph. Yeah. When you've been through that, it's not just an ordinary victory. It's not just something that tested you for, you know, six days, six months, maybe even for a year. And then you saw a victory. That would be a victory. But when you fought it for a very long time, when there were days when you thought that the thing would take your life, when you were sure that because you were on this course, because you were, you know, in this business, you know, sometimes you, even, even your academics, I've spoken to people before who they feel like, listen, they don't know if they're going to get to the other end of their master's. They feel like what this PhD is putting on them literally can cause them to take their life. It's a hard-drawn, hard-long fought battle. He paints that picture. And no doubt, the pressure of a life and a journey in Christ has its hardships. There is no doubt about it. If we look at the scripture, 2 Corinthians 4 and from verse 7, I'll read it in two versions. First of all, the Amplified Classic. It says that, however, we possess this precious treasure, which is the divine light of the gospel, that we possess it in frail human vessels of the earth, that the grandeur and the exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. It says that we are hedged in, we are pressed on every side. That we are troubled, that we are pressed in every way, but we're not cramped. We're not crushed. That we suffer embarrassment and we're perplexed and we're unable to find a way out, but we are not driven to despair. That we are pursued, persecuted, and hard driven, but not deserted to stand alone. We are struck down to the ground, but we are never struck out and destroyed. 
It says that we always carry about in the body the liability and the exposure to the same putting to death that the Lord Jesus suffered so that the resurrection life of Jesus may be shown forth by and in our bodies. It says, for we who live are constantly experiencing being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, that the resurrection life of Jesus may be evidenced through our flesh. And so death is actively at work in us, but it is so that life may actively be at work in you. This is Paul writing. Yet we have the same spirit of faith as he who wrote, I have believed and therefore I have spoken. We too believe and therefore we speak. Assured that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up also with Jesus and bring us along into his presence. If I read it in the Passion Translation, it says that we are like common jars of clay that carry this glorious treasure within so that the immeasurable power will be seen as God's and not ours. It says, though we experience every kind of pressure, we're not crushed. At times, we don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. We're persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but not out. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our own bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. We consider living to mean that we are cons cons constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake. And it goes on, like I say, but we have the same spirit of faith as him who said, I believe and therefore I speak. The journeys towards triumph look differently in every one of our lives. For some, it might be a health diagnosis. The other day, I was, I was speaking with someone on the phone who was saying, you know what, I just cannot, you know, I know that, you know, this is just probably a temptation of just faith. And I said to the person, you know, that the enemy is just really trying to discourage you so that you don't have hope. But she was just saying, you know what, I really don't know how to reconcile the fact that I can really pray for things as a believer and pray and pray and pray. And even know that this is the will of God and it's a good thing to desire. And for whatever reason, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, and I'm not seeing its physical manifestation. And I just said to her, you've got to continue to be encouraged. You've got to continue to actually invest faith. I said to her that, you know what, there is a temptation. There are three pathways that you can, you know, that you can stand on. You can decide to be in the camp that will be negative. That will just proclaim over your life, you know what, nothing is happening for me in marriage. Just forget it. Nothing is happening. The whole thing is just rubbish. You can actively speak those words over your life and over your destiny. There's another temptation to be in the middle and to be indifferent. And to just feel, you know what, I'm just going to turn down my expectation. Que sera, sera. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But I don't want to set myself up for the heartache. At the same time, I don't want it to be as if I don't trust God. Let me just be in the middle. You know, where you're just beige, you're just neutral. Okay, oh, good, oh. If the wind doesn't blow, good, oh. If it blows, good, oh. You know, you're just, it's, it's the safe zone. It's the way your mind, your mind, our mind tricks us to think that that is actually the safe place. That when you're in the place of neutrality, when you're, you know, you don't really desire it, but at the same time, you're not against it. You know, this is how you build an emotional wall around your heart. You put the walls up so that you are not hurt, so that you are not disappointed. When you hear the prophet say, Oh, by this time next year. And then next year, you're like, <laughs> okay, how far? Or oh, we are not calculating years. As a year is to God, is a thousand years, or how? <laughs> yeah, like how? Like the math is not mathing. And so the enemy comes in with discouragement, and we just, in our own, our soul just convinces of the logic that it's safest to be in the safe zone. But I'll share with her what I myself had to then say to myself, maybe two days later or a day later. And what I'll share with us is that the truth about it is that to be a believer is a journey of risk. It's a journey of risk. 
The gospel, as hard as it sounds, the gospel is not that you give your life to Christ and you're guaranteed that you're going to be married. It's very hard. It's very hard for me to stand up here and say that, but it is the truth. If we must pastor accurately, it is the truth. The gospel is not come to Christ and you will definitely find the bone of your bone and the flesh of your flesh. The gospel is not that if you come to Christ, you will be very, very wealthy and you will never lack again. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that your soul is sick and is in need of a savior. And there is no other name given amongst men by which you can be saved but that name Jesus. That is the gospel. There are many other benefits to the gospel. But at its crucial point, that is it, is the fact that you have to recognize your need for a savior. And to be able to secure an eternity reconciled with him versus an eternity under tribute, paying for the wages. I reminded her of the scripture. The Bible doesn't say that the gift of sin is death. It says that the wages of sin is death. It means that you have done the work of sin and you will now be paid your wages. The wages, the thing that is deserving of sin is death. And so the reason we give our lives to Christ is so that we don't pay that for eternity but that we have eternity with Christ. Reconcile. We get new glorified bodies. We get placed back into our place of absolute authority. The Bible says that at that time you will be known, fully known as you are. You will know and be fully known. There is a hope that awaits us ahead. That is the gospel. Like I say, there are many other benefits of our inheritance in Christ Jesus, which is why... We don't take it for granted that, yes, one of those benefits is the fact that you will be very wealthy. You will find the bone of your bone. All of the things that your heart desires. The Bible says, yes, that God desires to give you your heart's desire. The scripture says to us that which one of you, if you asked of your father to give you bread, will give you stone. Or if you asked of your father to give you fish, will give you a snake. No, your earthly father wouldn't do that. And at best, your earthly father is evil. So how much more so with a heavenly father? He wants to give you good things. Another scripture will say that if he has given us Christ Jesus, what else would he keep from us? If he has given you what cost him the most and what he only has one of, the scriptures say that the cattle on a thousand hills are his. All of the gold in where Nasarawa is, or Zamfara is God's. All of the tin, the whatever, all of the resources in Nigeria, all of the oil, all of the stuff in Saudi, all of the fish in the sea, all of the resource upon the face of the earth that man is aware of and man is not aware of. And in the skies above and whatnot that we would never even explore in our humanity belongs to God. All of it is his. He had one son, just one. And he gave up that son for you and I. So the scripture says, what would he not give you? And that is why we have the same spirit of, of faith with him who said, I believe and therefore I speak. And that is why the third camp is the camp we must find ourselves in. Not the negative camp, not the neutral camp, but the positive camp. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so though it is trying, though it is testing, though sometimes you don't have strength left in your spirit to do it, you must have the spirit of faith that still continues to speak the things that aren't as though they were. Yeah, I have a good and godly heritage. My marriage is blessed. And when I said, I want you to speak now that your marriage is blessed, she said, nobody's even toasting me or nobody's even here. <laughs> and I said, you are still going to say, my marriage is blessed. Yeah. Your marriage is blessed. Your children are blessed. They are taught by the Lord and great shall be their peace. Your family will live a holy legacy in the earth. As for you and your household, you will serve the Lord. Yes, God will set the solitary in families. You will speak over your life because it was the same journey of risk that Jesus Christ took. When Jesus Christ came in the earth and he took off his majesty and he lived our life, 
He took the risk that not everybody will accept him. He took the risk that you can spit in his face. He took the risk that you're going to reject him and say, nah, sorry, that's a scam. He took that risk, but he did it anyway. And it's why each and every one of us must take the risk to not be in the negative camp and speak wrongly. To also not erect walls to protect ourselves from what we think may be the unfaithfulness of God. Maybe he's not going to come through. So let me protect myself. But to dare to be bold, to walk the journey of triumph, that you know what, I'm going to get there and I'm going to have my shout of triumph. That I'm going to walk that road and I will sing my see what the Lord has done. That I'm going to walk that road and I'm going to be able to say, Jesus, yeah. yeah, you have done it again. I will dance my tobe chuku. Yes, because it is the same risk that Jesus took. He didn't take it as God. He took it as a man. He didn't have foresight into the future. He took it as a man. That maybe Tunde will not accept me. Maybe Anita will not say yes. Maybe Uche will deny me. Even before he has died, Peter has already said, I don't even know who he is. Yeah, but he's like, ha Pete. But it didn't stop him from putting himself on the cross. That in and of itself was enough to actually discourage him. That if they've already started now, ma, 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 spirit, beam me up, beam me up. To the Lord I go. Yeah, just leave them on their own, to their own devices. He took that risk. And so all of us, we live the journey of risk. Like we just read in this scripture, there are many times that we will be crushed, that we will be perplexed, that many suitors will come into your life, but because of your standards to honor God with your body, you will lose those suitors. That you will be mocked, you will be persecuted. People will say to you, what age are you? You are still doing this. No, no, no. What age are you? That your friends will laugh and be like, okay, because this thing is on the television, that's why you're closing your eyes. But because you've made a covenant with your eyes that you shall not look upon iniquity. Yeah, that even if you are 52, you'll say, nah, I will not watch the show. Are we together? Yeah, you're going to be mocked. This is it's just, it's our, it's our life. <laughs> we must just resign ourselves to it. But the journey culminates in triumph. The journey culminates in triumph. I'm going to speak about the role of joy on the way to triumph. Like I say, I have many um, confirmations, you know, for, for this message. When I think about even the Olympians, like I see, you know, like their journey doesn't start at the Olympics. The competition was fierce. For some of them to be the person representing their nation, they have stood against thousands. No matter what category they're in, whether they are swimming, whether they are doing long jump, whether they are doing short jump, whether they are doing short put, whatever it may be, many of them have stood against thousands. Those that will play football, basketball, whatever the case might be, rowing, the, I mean, some sports that you don't even think is a sport. It was when I was looking at the Olympics that I even realized there's a refugee team for the Olympics. I was like, wow. No, people are trying. There was like a whole team of like 15 of them that were representing the millions of people who are displaced forcefully worldwide. All different colors, all different countries representing refugees, the refugee team for the Olympics. I was thinking that if I'm running for my life, it's not to go to the Olympics that is on my mind. It's really not. But I think it was Celine Dion before she sang her song or after she sang her song for the opening of the Olympics said to many of them that many of you have come and the truth about it is not all of you are going to leave with gold. I'm paraphrasing what she said now. But she said, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that, that you are here alone. You have realized your dreams because I, their competition is fierce. And I want to encourage the believers of God, the people, who, I mean, really who are making a covenant with God. The scripture who say, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage, that no matter what, I'm going the distance with God. Not because it's easy for you. Actually, there is a lot of opposition against you in this journey 
whether, even from your family. Sometimes it's from those that you think will cheer you on. And actually, they're your fiercest, fiercest persecutors. There are people within this house who have left Islam, who have left whatever religion to know the Lord. And it has meant that they literally almost became orphans overnight. Not that their parents or family died, but essentially they were cold and in the world on their own. There are many things and many oppositions that we will fight. I want to speak about the role of joy. One of the articles that I read, it was more towards entrepreneurs, but it spoke, um, it gave a Christian perspective, and I'll just read out clips of it. And this is not just to entrepreneurs, though it speaks about entrepreneurs. And um, Kendra writes that, you know, many entrepreneurs wait for their winning season. Like I say, you wait for the act of triumph. You wait for your winning season when really, if you paid attention to it, you will understand that joy is not in a season or a consistent expected outcome. The sober truth is that joy is not found in circumstance. It's not only when you are able to shout your shout of triumph that you will have joy. Joy is in Jesus Christ. And I love that Paul has already let us know that our triumph is in Christ. And when your joy is in Jesus, it is always your winning season. Hallelujah. Some entrepreneurs will tell you that their joy is in their next six-figure launch or when everything is going exactly as planned or it's in a full calendar of high-playing kinds. That is when they have joy. But the danger of finding joy in these things is that if they do not happen as expected, you will only have access to joy if everything goes the way you planned. So if you come to conference and let's say Bishop Gideon has a word for you, have joy. Maybe you're believing for God to heal you of sickle cell. Maybe you're believing for God to, you know, give you a clear direction and a pathway for your life. Maybe you're believing for healing for a loved one. Whatever it might be, whatever the, whatever the promise you are contending for is, no matter the, the area of your life that it touches on, the danger of finding joy is that sometimes work, life doesn't always work out in that way. Like the lady that I was speaking to the other day and she felt, you know what, I really prayed for this person, but this person passed away anyway. Biblical joy isn't based on business success. It's not based on having the money you desire. It's not about people loving you or people never saying anything bad about you. None of these things are bad, and all of them are actually attainable. You can achieve all of them. But the focus here is on how to access true joy, which cannot be destroyed. And the Bible says this, that Galatians 5 and 22, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So the scriptures remind us that joy is actually a fruit of God's spirit and not something that we can produce by ourselves. And she concludes with this, which I just thought was so perfect and, again, confirmatory for this word and for this season that, that we're in. She says, even Philippians, which is to be considered the book of joy from a prison cell. And I love that because, of course, we've started the book of Philippians, right, with STS, the journey through Philippians, that it is a book of joy. I sense that Individually, on a family level, I know for sure on a global level that they are some, we are entering or maybe have even entered into a journey towards a triumph. And that is why I chose to speak today, not so much as the act of triumph, though I know Pasana also has, you know, a leading on this. And maybe when he comes back, he'll speak on the shout and the act of triumph, you know, in that sense but on the journey of triumph to really encourage us. Maybe you're already in a personal journey. Maybe we're going to enter one. 
You know, I keep seeing whether, you know, I know Pastor Nat had had this, you know, word on global hacking. I saw earlier this morning another video that Prophetess Tiffany Montgomery put out where I was just like, oh, please, I beg, the earth is not ready for this. Like, many people are just catching up from the pandemic. And she said something that, you know, I was sharing with my husband. She said last time in the pandemic, people had the internet to cope. That in the cyber warfare that is coming down, in the shutdown, in the Pearl Harbor of the net that is about to come, we won't even have the internet. In the cyber attack, which forces of wickedness want to conspire to do, we may not even have the internet. And she asked the question, what do you need to stock up on? What do you need if you were at home, for example, for the next 30 days and you were not able to access even the internet? And I was just like, e wo tun le le. Go then. We are just trying to do things, launch business, have, try and have life, do this, family, visit people, love people. Ah. You know, you're just, you're, the truth about it is that obstacles and hardships in, in real life and in the course of our faith, they don't give us warnings. Yeah, you don't always, you don't always know. Even when we have these words, somebody speaks a word, some people, you know, the scriptures say that we see in part, we prophesy in part, we don't know the timing of their occurrence. So it's always inconvenient. There is never a good time. You're going about your life and then all of a sudden you get a phone call. You're going about your life, je, 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 then somebody tells you this and this, the doctor said. There is never a convenient time for trials. Never a convenient time for hardships. There is never a convenient time for it to be 2,000 naira to the pound. There is never a convenient time. But my encouragement is this, that if we will fight the good fight of faith, if we will continue to have the same spirit of faith and continue to speak, if we will approach the journey like an Olympian, for some of them, like, the, you know, when you look at ballet, it is such a graceful art. You see them, let me not try it on this stage. <laughs> let me not even try it. My husband always reminds me about one thing I invited him to, we were not, we, we were just friends at the time, and it was in law school when we were in Buari, and I used to go to a redeemed church, which was not far from the campus of Buari at the time, and I don't know why some of my friends roped me in to do some play, and the play was on angels, and as part of the play, I had to do contemporary dance, and it's one of the stories my husband brings up frequently to abuse me with. He's just like, what were you doing? <laughs> He invited another one of our friends along. He's like, Oinko, you don't understand. I was in the crowd. I were just doing this. <laughs> Dressed in white. And I was just, you know, he was just like, you can't even imagine how you looked. <laughs> but really, when you look at the real art form of ballet or contemporary dance, it is such a graceful art. Beautiful. When you see them move. But when they take off, they are on point ballet flats for you. I want media to please just Google feet of a ballet dancer and then put the scripture up on screen. It is enough, no matter how beautiful they look in their, it is enough for you to say, I will never, it's okay, when football exists and footballers' feet do not look like this, why, what possessed me to go into this? I'm saying that the, the stuff, you know, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I buffet my body. I make it my slave. The way in which I put restraints, disciplines upon myself so that after I have preached the gospel, after I've shared the wonder and the light of this glorious gospel to everyone, I myself will not be a castaway. In the journey of triumph, whether it is a, micro, a microcosm or a mini journey of towards maybe being free of, of an addiction, or maybe just to be free of shackles. You know that the Lord God has said that your life belongs to Christ. You know that God has said for you that you are claimed. But by virtue of things that your fathers and your mothers have done, you continue to experience within you. You, you can feel it. Nobody has to tell you. you. You sense, you perceive maybe in your dream life, in the way life is going, there is just a contention over your destiny. I have loved ones like that. 
There are times that we will cry together. We have to encourage ourselves. I had to encourage a loved one like that who said, this, this contention over my marriage, God has said this. I've been encouraged. Prophets have said this. My pastor has said this. But you just, I, they I just haven't, there's just, I'm not, that full manifestation is just, it's not as it should be. Oh, this is not the picture I'm looking for. This is what it looks like on the outside. I want us to find a good picture. This is not even a good picture. I mean a real picture of what a ballet dancer's feet looks like. You know, sometimes we'll make that joke, thank God, you know, thank God I don't look like what I'm going through. Yeah. Because on the outside, you can look like a ballet dancer. Graceful, beautiful, wrapped in silk. But sometimes people don't know how battered and bruised you are on the inside. How much this fight of your life is taking from you. This journey to triumph, how much it is weighing on you. But we continue still. All of the things that the Olympians have to do, many of them, they don't believe in God or it's not for a religious purpose. They don't drink alcohol. They don't even want the extra weight that it may pile on them, the extra pounds. Some of them are in the gym. Some of them are waking up 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, running marathons. Some of them are choosing not to go to parties. Some of them miss their graduations. Some of them, I mean, they go through crazy things for this dream. And, and scripture lets us know that physical discipline is good, but spiritual discipline much more. For with physical discipline, you will win a crown, but it is not an eternal crown. How much more so with spiritual discipline? How much more so when we have been born into a faith that is encouraging us and painting for us a picture to be a spiritual Olympian? To approach the trials and the temptations of your life with the same mindset that these Olympians have had to approach their lives. Discipline. To fast. To give. To show up. To serve. When you feel like it. When you don't feel like it. To be kind. To be forgiving. To be forgiving. Sometimes is the greatest warfare that you can employ in a season. To guard your heart and to constantly keep it cleansed. When somebody comes to you with one whisper and says, oh, this person says this about you. Oh, and this person did this. And to, you know what? The other day I was reflecting on the scripture from Isaiah 53. It says that like a sheep before his sharers, Jesus Christ was dumb. That he opened not his mouth. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know, just on a, on, you know, it just was in my heart that, you know, sometimes in your life, some of the powerful moves, some of the, you know, the most powerful and impactful decisions you will make, you will have to make them in silence. You don't have to share it. It doesn't have to be on Instagram. Not everybody has to know what you're doing. But much deeper than that, then the Lord started to speak to me about forgiveness and about the scripture. And perhaps the reason that, like a sheep, he was dumb before his sharers was because in that moment, the level of pain, the level of angst, of anxiety, of betrayal, and everything that Jesus Christ was contending with, if he opened up his mouth, he might have cursed us. Sometimes your greatest act of warfare, when your family is against you, when your loved ones betray you, is actually to keep quiet. To guard your heart and to keep quiet so that you do not speak over the people you have come to redeem. Joseph, had, Joseph was in that place. And like I had to say to one of my loved ones the other day when, you know, she was broken. The level of contention over, again, marital destiny. I had to, you know what? Until the word of God, Psalm 105 and verse 12 or 19. Until the word of God came to pass, it tried Joseph. He tried him until the day he was able to shout. He had a very great triumph. But how many of us know that the journey to that triumph was anything but easy? The betrayal, the abandonment, the rejection. But still, he would buffet his body. I will still interpret dreams for people. Let them come. Even if I'm in a prison cell, yes, I'll continue to offer my gifts and talents to the Lord. I'll continue to be useful no matter where I am. I might not be in the, in the palace of Pharaoh. I might be in a place where everybody, baker, butler, Potiphar's wife, everybody has forgotten me. But I'll continue to serve the Lord. It was his great act of warfare. 
to continue to show up and to continue to stand. Ephesians 5 says that, that having done all stand, when you have put on, Ephesians 6 rather, when you have put on the helmet of your salvation, your belt of truth, your blessed breastplate of righteousness, you've held the sword of your faith, you've held your sword of the word, your shield of faith, having done all stand, therefore stand. Sometimes in your greatest warfare is just to continue to stand. To continue to show up and to go through. To adopt the mindset of an Olympian, believing that one day you will have your processional triumph where you will get to that place. You'll be able to cast your, your crowns before God and say, Ebenezer, you have carried me to this place. Thus far, you have carried me. Jesus said that before he went, he was praying to the Father for his disciples. He said, you, everyone that you have committed into my hands, not one have I lost except the son of perdition who was predestined for that purpose. Not one. As the travails of his soul was upon him, he began to reflect. And it is my prayer that in our ultimate journey of triumph, and even in the individual ones of our lives, the ones where nobody can see, I'm saying in your closet is where you are fighting your real warfare. Where nobody can see it, but you're choosing to be holy in your relationship. Where you're choosing to be holy in your singleness. Where there is no friend on the phone, there is no pastor prophesying, encouraging you, giving you a scripture, but you're saying this is the standard. This is the bond that I place upon myself, that the love of God shall constrain me. I adopt this Olympian mindset for the crown. The Bible says, for the joy that was ahead of him, he bore what he bore. He took upon our sins. He took upon our sicknesses. He didn't beat the air, just I'm beating for nothing. For the joy that was laid ahead of him. For the fact that he would inherit each and every one of us as co-heirs. That we would be able to be heirs with him. Heirs in Christ. Sons of God. He bore what he bore. He adopted the mindset of an Olympian. I want us to read a scripture as we close. I've spoken about the role of joy and I was going to touch on... The crucial perspective. Let me just read that. The crucial perspective. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. It says that our light and momentary affliction, the slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory. Beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, it is a vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. That was a lot of words. Let me read it in the Passion Translation. It says that we view our slight, short-lived troubles. And when you're going through it, it doesn't feel short-lived. Our slight, it doesn't feel slight. Our slight and short-lived troubles, but we view them in the light of eternity. That we see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an eternal, weighty glory far beyond all comparison. I said to my loved one the other day, I said that the glory that is coming, that is going to be confirmed on you, conferred on you, it will make all of the things that you are going through now seem like a light and momentary affliction. Yeah. When Joseph came into glory and he was promoted far above Potiphar, and all of what was committed into his hands was committed into his hands, yeah, it made the years that had gone before a very little thing. When Hannah received the gift of Samuel, it made her years of waiting a very little thing. Believe me, I know. Sometimes my husband and I sit down and we just reflect and we look at Zach and we say to Zach, my, my husband says to Zach, Zach, you are worth the wait. You are worth the wait. I want to encourage you, whatever your stance for the Lord might be, on a journey and on a battle that is hard, hard fought and long drawn, that you will get to the place of triumph. Whether it is in your health, whether it is in your, your, your battle to enforce the right, be the righteousness of Christ, in, uh, of God in, of Christ. Okay. 
This is the hint from above. You are out of time. <laughs> okay, as we end, let's read 1 Peter 1 in the Passion Translation. This is the last. And if choir can get up, we'll sing two songs, Undum and More Than Conquerors by Kirk Franklin. If nobody knows the song, media can have it ready for us. But we'll sing, we'll read 1 Peter 1. Let me see, for sake of time. Don't know if we can read all of it. Let's read all of it. So we read from one. And just just put yourself, you know, put yourself in the scripture. If I can have the keys as well. Okay, so from Peter, writing now. From Peter, an apostle of Jesus, the anointed one, to the chosen ones, which is you and I. But writing at the time he was writing, he says, to the chosen ones who have been scattered like seed into the nations, living as refugees in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and throughout the Roman provinces of Asia and Bithynia. You are not forgotten. And this is what I will say to every one of us, everyone watching online, every believer. Whatever hard fought, whatever long drawn battle you are fighting, you are not forgotten. For you have been chosen and destined by Father God. The Holy Spirit has set you apart to be God's holy ones. Obedient followers of Jesus Christ who are gloriously sprinkled with his blood. May God's delightful grace and peace cascade over you many times over. In Jesus' name. Celebrate with praises the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has shown us his extravagant mercy. For his fountain of mercy has given us a new life. We are reborn to experience a living, energetic hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are reborn into a perfect inheritance that can never perish, never be defiled, and never diminish. It is promised and preserved forever in the heavenly realm for you. Through our faith, the mighty power of God constantly guards us until our full salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. May the thought of this cause you to jump for joy. Even though lately you've had to put up with the grief of many trials, but these only reveal the sterling core of your faith which is far more valuable than gold that perishes, for even gold is refined by fire. Your authentic faith will result in even more praise, glory, and honor when Jesus, the anointed one, is revealed. You love him passionately, although you have never seen him. But though believing in him, you are saturated with an ecstatic joy, indescribably sublime and immersed in glory for you are reaping the harvest of your faith the full salvation promised you which is your soul's victory that's what I said that is the gospel is that we receive our soul's victory every other thing is part of just the inheritance this salvation was the focus of the prophets who prophesied of this outpouring of grace that was destined for you. They made a careful search and investigation of the meaning of their God-given prophecies as they probed into the mysteries of who would fulfill them and the time period when it will all take place. The spirit of the anointed one was in them and was pointing prophetically to the sufferings that Christ was destined to suffer 
and the glories that would be released afterward. God revealed to the prophets that their ministry was not for their own benefit, but for yours. And now you have heard these things from the evangelists who preach the gospel through to you through the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The gospel containing wonderful mysteries that even the angels long to get a glimpse of. So then... Prepare your hearts and minds for action. Stay alert and fix your hope firmly on the marvelous grace that is coming to you. For when Jesus Christ is unveiled, a greater measure of grace will be released to you. As God's obedient children, never again shape your lives by the desires that you followed when you did not know better. Instead, shape your lives to become like the Holy One who called you. For scripture says, you are to be holy because I am holy. Since you all call on him as your heavenly father, the impartial judge who judges according to each one's works, live each day with a holy awe and reverence throughout your time on earth. For you know that your lives were ransomed once and for all from the empty and futile way of life that was handed down from generation to generation. It was not a ransom payment of silver and gold, which eventually perishes, but the precious blood of Christ, who like a spotless unblemished lamb was sacrificed for us. This was part of God's plan. For he was chosen and destined for this before the foundation of the earth was laid. But he has been made manifest in these last days for you. It is through him that you now believe in God, who raised him up from the dead and glorified him, so that you will fasten your faith and hope in God alone. Now because of your obedience to the truth, you have purified your very souls. And this empowers you to be full of love for your fellow believers. So express this sincere love toward one another passionately and with a pure heart. For through the eternal and living word of God, you have been born again. And this seed that he planted within you can never be destroyed. But will live and grow inside of you forever. For human beings are frail and temporary that is the truth like grass and the glory of man is fleeting like the blossoms of the field the grass dries and the withers and withers and the flowers fall off but the word of the Lord endures forever and this is the word that was announced to you let's be on our feet hallelujah thank you Lord for the reading of your word it may sound just like English, but we know that it is not. Thank you that when your word is read, literally the spirit of God enters into us. Thank you that when your word goes forth, it will not return void. It will surely accomplish the purpose for which it has been sent forth. God, your word has been read out this morning. I pray that it would go and it would penetrate the hearts of your people. It would access the chambers that it needs to access. It would do the work that you desired for it to do. And I pray that this word on triumph that you have brought forward in this season, God Almighty, that it would encourage your people as you desire for it to do. That they will have their act of triumph, but that you will also be with them to strengthen them to release grace unto them, to walk and to fight along the journey towards that triumph. God, you're a gracious God. You're a good God. Blessed be your holy name, God. May your peace be released unto us many times over. May the grace of the Lord God empower us on the inside. Oh, yes. Many of the triumphs and the victories that we are contending for now, not just for us. Like Joseph, he realized that.
the word of God says that his deliverance was for, it was for the salvation of many. It was not just for him. All of what he was going through was so that one day in the midst of famine, Israel, a whole posterity might be preserved. I want to give an opportunity for anybody in this place or online who needs to give their lives to the Lord so that all of these promises, all of these things that we have talked about, so that you can secure for yourself a real triumph at the end, wherever you are, just raise your hands as an international sign of surrender. Just surrender to the Lord. Raise your two hands to the Lord. Whether you've made the decision before, or you're making it for the first time. And just invite Jesus into your heart. Say to him, dear Jesus, I come to you today. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. That I've lived my life as though I am my own God. But I realize I have been wrong. I ask you today, forgive me of my sins. Wash me with your blood. Adopt me as your child. Give me your Holy Spirit to live inside of me and to guide me all the days of my life. From today henceforth, I am a child of God. Thank you, Jesus.